Hi guys, welcome back to nap time at our house. <laughs> welcome back to Too Cool for Middle School. I have a almost two month old baby right now. And so I'm just kind of squeezing in videos whenever I can, whenever she's napping, and whenever I convince myself to ignore the laundry and the dishes and all of the other things that I need to do. So today we are going to do like a March wrap up little review video, but what I've been doing this year in 2022 is kind of like looking at the books that I read in a certain month and then seeing like a common theme that goes through those books and then just making a video like on that theme. So today's video is about books by some amazing indigenous authors and we're gonna take it in like a little bit of a weird direction you'll see in a second maybe like an unexpected direction but i've been enjoying kind of like putting together like text sets for myself sort of so the four books that i read in the month of march were love medicine by louise erdrick the white girl by tony birch all that followed by Gabriel Urza, and then A Man Called Uva by Frederick Bachman. And this one I actually listened to on audiobook. I had bought this copy and then I lost it. I couldn't find it anywhere. Listened to it on audiobook literally by the time I was on like the last chapter of the audiobook, I found it. Now I have it. There's also a movie. You can rent it on Amazon Prime. The movie was really good. That would have fit into my last month's <laughs> theme, which was books to movie or TV adaptations. But yeah, I really liked this one. I'm not gonna do a full review of it in this video since it doesn't fit our theme, but I really liked it. I also loved the movie. And maybe I'll do like just a whole Frederick Bachman video one day because I like his books so far. I've read two of them. People keep recommending other titles saying that they are like even better. So maybe we'll do a whole Frederick Bachman video soon. But for today, let's talk about five books by amazing indigenous authors. These are more for adults. These are really, you know, not like young adult or middle grades books. I think I'll do a separate video with really good options to use in a classroom, like in literature circles or something like that. But for today, these are just, these are just for us. I'm going to start with two that I had read previously. So this one, wow, it's, it's pretty thick. This one's a nice heavy book. This one is The Firekeeper's Daughter by Angeline Bouley. It does say young adult. This is from Reese's YA Book Club, but this isn't all that YA-ish to me. Like I really enjoyed it as an adult and I wouldn't put this in like my middle school classroom. Like for high schoolers, sure, but like all of the characters in this are like out of high school. A few are like seniors and then some are adults. So it's just, it's not really geared towards like younger kids, I didn't think. But it's an amazing book for adults. And then the cover to me made me think that it was going to be like a fantasy book. It just kind of gave off those vibes, but it's not really. It's more of a murder mystery. Um, there is a girl who goes missing and they're trying to kind of uncover like who's involved in her disappearance and then it turns into you know finding out that there's something more going on in the community and it takes place oh it's been a little while since i've read this on the ojibwe reservation or near there uh, kind of like on and off um which is in michigan i believe the author is of course indigenous so she does a really good job of kind of like pulling on those threads of identity in the main character whose mother, mm, father, no, no, father was um, Ojibwe and then her mother was white. So she kind of like doesn't feel like she fits into either community. The community in this book is a big hockey community. So if you enjoy reading about that, you'll also really like this book. Um, it's, it's dark for sure. Like the subject matter is just dark but it's so engaging and it just like, you know, pulls on your heart. Like you just want to keep reading and find out what's going on, find out what actually happened, make sure that all of your favorite characters are safe. So I highly recommend this one. It won a bunch of awards. Um, I think it came out like last year. So I would love to see what you guys think about this one if you've read it. Okay, nap time didn't last very long, so we're gonna have a little co-reviewer for the rest of the video. 
Okay, we'll have to be kind of quick. The next book that I want to recommend is The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones. And Stephen Graham Jones is a horror author. And I don't really read horror books. That isn't usually something that I'd enjoy. I don't really like horror movies. But I do actually love this book. Um, it was part of Amory's book club a little over a year ago, probably. And I surprised myself because I loved it so much. Um, it's about, I'm trying to like remember all the details. There's these four friends and they do something on the reservation that's like not terrible, but it's against tradition. They kind of like do it for the right reasons, but the consequences of that decision haunt all four of them in different ways and some of them try to leave the reservation, but the curse is still with them. Um, it's just so incredibly well written and you're just like trying to figure out like, so do they get to survive this? Like was what they did that bad? Are they gonna, are they, is there a way out? And one of the characters' daughters is like a really good basketball player, which really is like another genuine aspect of a lot of reservation communities or indigenous communities like basketball tends to be a pretty big thing it was in the town where i grew up um and so she is like this really good basketball player and the way that he describes like a one-on-one -on -one basketball game is just masterful like i've never seen anyone use words <laughs> to describe a sport in it, in such an amazing way so um, I remember I wanted to take like a couple of those sections and like use them just as mentor texts in my classes because they're so good just the descriptive language is absolutely incredible and I think I also listened to this one like partially on audiobook and then I read it as well I kind of went back and forth and the reader is really really good I remember that so either physical book or audiobook definitely recommend the only good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones. My next recommendation is from Louise Erdrich. This one is Love Medicine. This is her first book. So I've read quite a few of Louise Erdrich's books and um, I really wanna read The Sentence, which is her newest book, but I just like made a deal with myself. Like I'm gonna read her first one before I read her latest one. I just wanted to go back to the beginning and see, you know? She's an incredibly prolific author and she owns a bookstore and I think that like weaves its way into the plot of the most recent book but this one her first one is about an indigenous community near the Twin Cities like most of her her books are set in that area and then like Firekeeper's Daughter is set in that area as well. Firekeeper's Daughter actually has like you, you could see the Louise Erdrich influence in it. it it's its own unique story but um, there are some similarities to a lot of Louise Erdrich's books. So usually in her books there are a lot of characters and I think that's just like a technique that she uses to kind of show how like wide and deep the community is because she'll introduce all of these different people and they are all very well developed. Like each of the characters is really unique and you're like in your mind kind of trying to keep track of all of them. And I think she's trying to show like, you know, in this community there are all these different people and they have all these different connections. Some of them are related, some of them they're half brothers but they don't know and some of them were adopted or, you know, they had a falling out back in the day so their two families don't talk but then these two are together or whatever. So you're supposed to keep track of all of these ties between the different people. There's of course like a Catholic church and school um, near the reservation, you know, and, and a lot of the characters have trauma from what they experience there. There are some characters who like go to the city, you know, and, and they kind of try to make a different life for themselves there, but a lot of times they are just kind of like pulled back into their families and into their community. So this one is really beautiful. I think this is a great introduction to Louise Erdrich and I can see like some offshoots of some of these stories that like weave their way into her later books and she kind of like expands upon some of the ideas that she started with here. And in the back of the book, um, it lists all of the books that she's written. 
I knew she'd written a lot, but oh my goodness, there's so many. And there's like a little description of each one. And there are so many that I want to read. So by the end of my lifetime, <laughs> I hope to read all of her books. She's got to slow down. She's got to stop writing them because I need to catch up. <laughs> the Roundhouse is probably my favorite. I also read The Night Watchman recently. I want to read The Sentence. And then there's just a bunch more that she's done that I want to read. So if you've read any of her other books, let us know in the comments which one should we jump to next. Can you see this sweet little face? <laughs> She's just so cute. She just wants to be held. She doesn't like taking a nap all by herself. <laughs> so the first one that I had read in the month of March was Love Medicine. And then for Amory's book club in the month of March, we read this one, The White Girl by Toni Birch. And at first, you know, they didn't really seem connected. But since I read them back to back, I'm like, oh, these these do have a lot of common themes. So this one is set in Australia, actually, and it's about a community of like, indigenous Aboriginal people. And I didn't really know much about like the history of Australia and how they treated, you know, the native people there. Sorry, I have to bounce. Um, <laughs> But there is a lot of crossover, obviously. I mean, colonialism isn't all that creative. The British colonists use techniques all over the world that were similar. So it's interesting because this book gets into a lot of like the, the legal forms of oppression against, and they are, they are called like black there. There's a lot of crossover between like how in the United States, um, we've oppressed indigenous people as well as black people. Um, and so it, it's its own unique history in Australia, but it's important to see like how some of the same techniques are used, you know? So anyway, some of those like legal forces of oppression can also sometimes be used as loopholes. So I always like books, movies, <laughs> anything where um, somebody uses like a legal structure that was supposed to oppress them and then they flip it and they are able to use it as a loophole. I just love to see people's own laws being used against them, you know? So this one, it's like about um, this woman, she's a grandmother, she's Aboriginal, and then um, her daughter had a daughter with someone white and she doesn't know who at the beginning. So then her granddaughter is like light-skinned. Um, and so the sheriffs or, you know, like the, the law enforcement around her, uh, wants to take away light skinned kids from the, their Aboriginal parents or families, um, you know, for their welfare. So this gets into, you know, some of those same like boarding schools, Catholic schools that took kids away from their parents, you know, for their own good, um, and the horrible trauma and like trauma <laughs> is not nearly a strong enough word. I mean, that's that's the word for the people who survived, but it was just like mass murder or mass negligence that resulted in deaths of all of these innocent kids and then these parents who had their kids ripped away from them for no reason and there was nothing that they could do about it. So it's a really heartbreaking book. Just, you know, learning about that history that I didn't know much about, but there is you know, so much crossover, like reading these two, you see how some of those same forces were used against colonized and marginalized people. So um, yeah, with this video, I was just trying to think too, like, okay, well, you know, indigenous also refers to the indigenous people of Australia. Um, I, I wanted to grab a book from a Palestinian author. This one isn't though, the Sandy Tolan guy, he's not actually Palestinian. He's just a reporter, so then this one didn't work. Um, Susan Abul Dawa, I think is her last name. I've read one of her books. I know there's another one I wanna read that would fit into this category as well. So I think it's just interesting to kind of like connect how indigenous people on like multiple continents are treated by, it's I guess pretty much always, you know, European colonizers and just looking at at those different stories. So the last one that I'm gonna put in this category, it's a little bit different, but it's called All That Followed by Gabriel Urza, and it's from the perspective of 
Basque people in Spain. And Gabriel Orza is Basque. I think he was born in the United States, but his parents were born in the Basque country and then he lived in the Basque country for part of his life. And now I think he lives in like Reno, which is near where I'm from. And there are a lot of Basque people in that area because um, they came here during Franco's regime, um, mostly to be like sheep herders. That's what they did in the Basque country and the Pyrenees mountains a lot of times. So Basque people are indigenous to Southern France, Northern Spain, like that Pyrenees mountains region. And they, um, there's a lot of evidence that they're like ethnically unique from, um, you know, a lot of the other people in Europe, like they might have some different DNA markers, um, but their language is, as far as we know, like one of the most ancient languages that is still around right now. And it's a language isolate, so it's nothing like Spanish or French. It's called Uscara, or, you know, you could say like you speak Basque or whatever. Um, so this book is from the perspective of three different people. One is an American teacher who comes to the Basque country in like the 40s, 50s, I think, to teach English at a school. So he's there during Franco's regime um, and he's there for like 40 years, um, but he doesn't speak Basque. He never learns to speak Basque. He speaks Spanish and English and that's like kind of the true marker of like whether or not you're um, you know, accepted into the community. And then there's also a Basque woman. So she has her chapters as well. And she's married to a Spanish politician. And then there's a Basque kid, like high school age kid, who is kind of like loosely connected to this group called the ETA that is a Basque separatist group. So under Franco, because Franco, among many other horrendous, horrendous things, um, wanted Spanish people to all be like unified under the Spanish language and Spanish culture and the Catholic Church. Um, he outlawed the Basque language and other minority languages in Spain. Um, and so there were opposition groups that formed and then, you know, some of them want the Basque country to be its own country and not part of Spain. But like, even if you if you talk to, to Basque people, you don't say like, I wanna go to Spain. If you wanna go to like Donostia, San Sebastian, like you say, I wanna go to the Basque country. Um, so when I was in high school, I, I meant to mention this at the beginning, um, we had these two Basque foreign exchange students come for the summer and then actually they came like the next summer as well. I got to know them super well, like they were just, Two of my best friends, Hoshin and Nerea. There's actually a Nerea in this book. There's two Nereas in this book. No Hoshins though. Um, and yeah, I got to learn so much about like the Basque culture and language and stuff from them. And then um, I went and visited them when I was like 18 or 19 in the Basque country. And that was so cool. And so I know like, <laughs> I know just like random vocabulary words in Basque. I don't actually speak it. Um, but when I was in college, I was a European studies major for a while. I had several majors, but um, so like whenever I would write papers or whatever in like European geography or whatever class I was taking, I would always, you know, focus on like studying Basque history. So it was, I, I was purposely looking for a book that was about Basque people written by a Basque person. It's hard to find in English, but this one is so good. Like I just, I read it pretty quickly with one hand like this <laughs> because it was just so fun for me to read about those little details, like the quadrillas. That's like your group of basically like lifelong friends that you just like go bar hopping with <laughs> until you die, basically. Like <laughs> these old men go to the same bars, the same, you know, nights per week or whatever, and eat certain food, like what is it, like pinchos or whatever. Um, so, you know, a lot of those details just kind of came back to me. This is set in like a small town, like outside of, I've only really been to like um, Bilbao, like San Sebastian, Donostia area. Um, so this is like a smaller town where there's like a lot less wealth, you know, people had less opportunities and stuff. And so um, it's not all about like the ETA and, you know, the Basque separatists, but like the ultimate conflict basically comes out of that. And these kids who, 
they just kind of want to be part of something. Uh, I think they don't even necessarily know what they want. They don't know if they want to be their own country. And at this point in the book, you know, there's no more Franco to rebel against. Um, but there, there's something like there's, there's still this like pent up anger and resentment about how they were treated and how, um, you know, their language, how that was attempted to, you know, just destroy their language and their culture. Um, so it's an interesting exploration of that. And I feel like I haven't read books like set in Europe in quite a while, you know, because there is kind of like a condemnation, you know, of being too Eurocentric and only reading these like, you know, dead white men authors from Europe or whatever. But I think it's interesting to explore like the ethnic minorities within Europe, like the Basques in Spain. And I, I think that, you know, you don't have to avoid like authors or books or settings or whatever, like from a certain area of the world, but you can purposely like seek out the stories of people who you, you haven't heard those stories before, you know. So anyway, this got me interested in reading more about the Spanish Civil War. So right now I'm reading another book about the Spanish Civil War and then I have another one like that'll be up next after that. So I think that will be our next theme. Fountains of Silence and then A Long Petal of the Sea. So we'll talk about those two next month, I think. And if there's any others that you would recommend about the Spanish Civil War besides For Whom the Bell Tolls because <laughs> I was thinking about reading that one by Hemingway, you know, and it's like 500 pages. So I think <laughs> I will probably never read it. Like I know what it's about. I've got like the cliff notes. I don't know if I can read 500 pages by Hemingway without being forced to though. <laughs> so let me know if you have any other recommendations though. That'll be like up next in our thematic videos. Ooh, okay. It is literally 100 degrees today and she doesn't like being under the air conditioning. So ugh, I'm just very hot. Like that's why I'm wearing this <laughs> moo moo basically. Whew. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me through this kind of chaotic video. Let us know if there are any other um, indigenous authors. They could definitely be Native American, but you know, maybe even kind of thinking outside that experience. Um, you know, are there any other books that you've read by indigenous people like about that experience? that you would recommend. I would really love to get just like a whole bunch of different recommendations and just kind of like get our wheels turning like, oh yeah, okay, that would be a good one to include about discussions of like indigenous identity. So yeah, thank you again for watching and <laughs> I will see you next time we can get a good nap in. <laughs> Bye guys. Ooh, boop, boop, boop.